Okay, um, our next talk this morning is by Yuri Gurevich. <laughs> no. No need, no My thanks to organizers and also to Simon Institute and to Omid, who provided all the equipment which I could possibly need. Okay, logic in computer science, engineering, and industry, and maybe math. So, all major ideas that logicians worked upon in the first part of the last century found applications in computer science. For example, types. So if you know, uh, this originated with Russell and Whitehead. So Frege had uh, a little problem. In <laughs> his system happened to be uh, contra um, had a contradiction. And the way Russell and why he solved this problem, they introduced types. So there are elements, type 0, sets of elements, type 1, sets of sets, type 2, and so on. These ideas are used in programming languages. So the first thing uh, any program, uh, say, compiler does, it checks uh, type correctness. <coughs> but there's much more. So let me say, for example, uh, if, if you remember, Java was a big deal. So many programming languages suddenly said Java came. So what was the big deal about Java? So when you compile a programming language, you don't compile it directly to very low level. You compile it to some kind of um, virtual machine. And the novelty with Java was that the, that the virtual machine was using exactly the same types that Java was using. So that was uh, a big deal. Now, Microsoft picked up that idea and created .NET, where um, invigorated programming language research. Because what happened, the .NET, it's a strange name, but it's a kind of virtual machine, universal virtual machine, uh, much richer than Java virtual machine. And any programming language can be compiled. So for example, you have some idea of experimental programming language. If you compile it to .NET, <laughs> then you can use any constructs written in any language because they will be <laughs> there. Computability. There were three approaches. Recursive functions originated, uh, okay, I don't know, originated, but one interesting point was Hilbert, who asked, who was interested whether primitive recursion is all recursion there is. <laughs> so he had two students, Wilhelm uh, <coughs> Ackermann and Roger Petter, and he constructed. Uh, the famous Ackermann function, <laughs> but she did much more thorough job and in investigated all kind of recursion, which uh, was useful for people who came later. Uh, another approach was lambda calculus, which is wildly used in uh, programming semantics, uh, and then Turing machines. So recursion, of course, widely used. You can't avoid recursion. If you have finite program, you cannot just finish when the, uh, go through it once, because um, the run may be much longer, and you have to recurse in your program. So it uses for syntax. It uses for sim for uh, implementation. Uh, lambda calculus used in particular in uh, various functional programming languages. Now machines uh, gave rise to modern complexity theory. There was some complexity theory before that, before the machines. People worked with circuits. And I'll touch on this a little later. But uh, one thing was to understand uh, what, what today seems so obvious, you, you, have, you need to take into account how much resource you have, time or space. That was not such a 
a simple problem. Many problems are kind of becomes almost trivial, but at the time, my didn't look like that. Uh, maybe I say a word. I happened to discuss with both of them uh, how they arrived to this problem. So Cook arrived in a way any logicians could arrive. So it's an analogy with recursive versus RE. So polynomial time corresponds to recursive, and, and P corresponds to RE. With Levin's was a very different story. So in Russia, in, uh, something came from those circuit complexity, working with circuits. And uh, think about some radio. There is a circuit. Qu a question arises, can you, can you do that same radio with a smaller circuit using less uh, gates? And, um, Somebody, Blonsky, came up with a conjecture that you cannot. There is this exhaustive search. In this case, it's a kind of double exhaustive search. In our terms, you, you guess. You, you, for, for every other, you have to show that um, which, for every small, OK. Think a little bit. It's sigma two or pi two. One, one of those. <laughs> right. Um, <coughs> then uh, the same Yablonsky wrote a paper where he um, s wrote that he improved on this exhaustive search. Russian word is peribor, so he improved on peribor. Uh, Trachtenbrod disagreed, was duly punished, and Levin came for, for Levin, uh, this inequality was a, a way to formalize this idea that Peribor cannot be eliminated. It was kind of informal idea, and this was a kind of uh, formalization of that idea. What was Trachtenbrot's contribution to the first uh, bullet? He, he discovered this uh, independently. Okay. Time space hierarchy? Yes. Mm -hmm. So also the notion, the notion of how to count space, how to count time. Uh, model theory gave rise. Let me see. Keep track of time. Uh, for example, to relational databases. One problem which have been discussed uh, in this conference related to to this polynomial time on structures, arbitrary structures, not necessarily on strings. And that arose in, uh, in database theory, no, in database practice. Because imagine you have a database. Uh, what is database? It's a set of relations. There is no particular order among these relations. Now, in each relation, there are these tuples. And again, there is no particular order for, for the tuples. But when you try to work with this database in your computer, necessarily there is an order. And suppose I ship this database to you, and then you store it in your computer, and then there is another order. And what they discovered that the queries written in language like C tend to have different answers in different places. And that's led to the language, uh, quite famous language, SQL or SQL where there is no order. Syntactically, you cannot refer to order. It was a big achievement. All this happened before uh, theorists looked at the problem. Proof theory gave rise to set solvers, uh, SMT solvers, satisfiability module theory, proof engines. Um, but of course, uh, you cannot ahead of time think of everything. So certain issues came. Uh, finite automata. Uh, interesting logicians started. <laughs> One of them is right here. David uh, Scott and Michael Rabin. And this is, uh, of course, of hu hugely exploited uh, kind of machines. 
when you teach computation theory, you write little automata and so on. But uh, automata that actually used uh, often are huge. For example, lexical analyzer for uh, a decent language will not be very small. Formal languages, again, <laughs> logicians. A logician was there in the beginning. Um, regular language, context-free languages. One interesting thing that did not occur to logicians ahead of the time, that there are so many different levels of abstraction. So if you have, a, OK, this computer, there is a level where um, single bits live, machine level. There's assembly level, level of programming language. In fact, there are many intermediate languages between, <coughs> as I mentioned, between programming language and assembly language, there may be a uh, virtual machine uh, level. And there are many, many tools which work with, uh, say, compiler takes you down. Uh, okay, translator take, takes you kind of horizontally <laughs> in any place. But when you abstract and write specification, so you go up. One interesting kind of underappreciated achievement is this. So finite state machines in regular languages are in certain relation, which you will know. It's the same relation like non-deterministic PDAs, but push down automata and context-free languages. So these languages uh, are heavily studied. But the interesting thing that in programming, you have uh, the PDAs are deterministic. <coughs> so if you take language, say, C, the recursion, there is a PDA which implements a recursion. So what's here? So, and so why do you say this is underappreciated? I mean, theory of DPDA, you know, of deterministic context-free languages is a pretty big... OK, so uh, this problem okay, was solved by uh, uh, Donald Knuth. And it completely revolutionized um, uh, compiling. So before Knuth, it was sort of art. <laughs> and after that, uh, there's still a lot of art, but there was a lot of science. So those LR languages. Uh, why I say underappreciated, uh, when I came across this and wanted to find a proof, I couldn't find any textbook which a proof would be nicely written. And so many, everything, so much written about context three. Yeah. Anyway, my uh, um, subjective impression, it's underappreciated. Uh, this is a so, uh, famous V diagram in software engineering. So imagine a piece of software. So first you come with some idea, then you refine it, refine. Eventually you write code, and then it, you test this code. You test uh, small pieces and bigger pieces. Uh, and in software engineering, there is a very important problem. Imagine that. So there was some kind of logic error on that level. It will be discovered when you test. And if it is uh, important software done in industry, so many, many people may, may, might have spent a lot, a lot of time until it's discovered. And then what? Not so easy to correct. So there was a lot of interest of uh, to, to the levels of abstraction and working on arbitrary levels of abstraction. Um, <coughs> so logicians or people who came from mathematics typically favor declarative approaches. Engineers also swear that they prefer declarative, but uh, the reality is very different because suppose you have this uh, specification written in some declarative way. 
in industry it's often written in Z. So now it's less fashionable, but still people, sometimes a company goes to some Z company, asks them to write specification, and now at the end of this process you have a book. And here is software. And there's a huge difference between a book and a software because uh, I, I think I will come later to exactly that same problem, so let me s skip it here. And uh, abstract state machines, that was the idea. So you want to understand what's an algorithm, not what is computable, but what is an algorithm. And different levels of abstraction have different algorithms. Okay, so the idea was, is there a kind of generalization of Turing idea, a kind of machine which works on all levels of abstraction? And uh, in sequential case and some other cases, it turns out that the answer is yes, somewhat unexpectedly. And so so in, in fact, that what brought me to, to Microsoft and we <coughs> created a tool called Spec Explorer. Um, See. Maybe I'll skip it now. <laughs> um, return um, later to this if I have an opportunity. Um, engineers use logic very explicitly. Uh, in general, when you talk to, say, electrical engineer or computer engineer and you say logic, for them it's circuits. Logic is circuits. Uh, very early I discovered that they have um, many, many, uh, many valued logics. So I wrote a paper in 1980s called Logic and the Challenge of Computer Science. And at the time, uh, I wrote that between 3 and 30, I think, uh, there are engineering logic with all the n between 3 and 30 and n-valued logics. So I tell you the idea why, why, why suddenly they need many values. So if, if there is a large circuit, then theoretically it's composed from gates. Say, tip, in textbooks, they often say NAND gates. It's the only gate which su suffices in many copies. But gates are expensive. So what they do, they do all kind of shortcuts. But at the end, the circuit is supposed to compute that same um, Boolean function. So they need to somehow convince at least themselves that the circuit works correctly. And so they introduce logics where the uh, logical values may be uh, low amperage and medium amperage and high amperage and things like that. And some of these logics are terrible, maybe not closed under conjunction. Or, and um, there is this community who, who, where badly needs a logician to help them. And there's a zillion people working in many valued logics, and they are well separated. I came to this issue thanks to my uh, colleague at Michigan, uh, John Hayes, who, want, who noticed a series of uh, logics which people used in two levels, and he realized that there was a whole series, and they're all useful. And he worried that logicians know all that. And I tried to look into logic literature, literature and so for semester, he and I discussed this issue with meeting once uh, a week. One chooses a restaurant for lunch, another one pays. But the real reason why logic is so important is it, it's used in a way they don't realize, kind of implicitly. It, the reason is that there are so many formal languages all over the place. Programming languages, database languages, specification languages. Even if you go to domains which are presumably um, declarative, like uh, 
authentication authorization. Even there, there are, um, let's see, typic typically what will happen there, say, uh, it's not just to give you a permit. This permit needs to be sent to somebody who will take certain measures so that you, in practice, will be able to, to, to access the system. So, so in fact, engineers use logic sort of day in and day out, typically without realizing that. Writing specifications uh, at ever-increasing abstraction levels, writing compilers. Compiler for, for, say, C typically is written in C. So in, so in fact, today, to explain to, to a compiler writer, to explain Gödel's theorem is not difficult, uh, incompleteness theorem, not so difficult, because compiler for C is written in C. So the idea that the basic idea of arithmetization is right there. Um, so can, have you written the program that says, I do not, I do not compile? Or? No. <laughs> <laughs> we speak about constructive uses, <laughs> positive uses of logic. <laughs> Maybe in this connection, um, I sh let me come back, mention this kind of paradox. What seemed to be difficult may turn out to be easy and the other way around. For example, a halting problem, a kind of the standard undecidable problem. There is a tool at um, Microsoft Research Cambridge in, in the UK called uh, Terminator, which solves halting problem many times a day for C programs. So bring your C program. I, I, I thought about it because uh, if, if you, as a logician, you, you may, of course, write something that, <laughs> that this tool will not work. But in reality, for normal C programs, it works pretty well. In fact, fast. On the other hand, uh, um, Tarski prove the decidability of uh, real arithmetic. And if we had a feasible algorithm for that, it would be huge, huge progress in uh, uh, programming uh, methodology. So they widely used linear arithmetic because it's uh, easily decidable. So at all practical purposes, real arithmetic is not decidable. So few studied logic <coughs> of engineers. Um, instead, they studied calculus. I speak about now software industry. It's, it's very different from you know, various uh, manufacturing production stuff. Um, so engineers that I talk to probably never use calculus. <coughs> and even there are uh, some of them, especially the architects, some of them are brilliant. They can prove theorems, they could do physics. So they went to industry and made careers, are well paid and uh, do interesting stuff. <laughs> but even uh, the brightest of them do not know logic. Some even don't realize that there is such a science which can be useful to them. So here is a, from a real conversation. So, okay, thank you. I was trying to sell my access control language. And I was explaining that the, the, the other language, the, the competitor, uh, my language is better. I was ex explaining how it is better. So this guy listened, listened, and then summarized. OK, their language is a subset of yours. Because they don't have the vocabulary to say, you know, one language may be richer than the other in many, many ways. Of course, the other language was not a subset of, of mine by any means, but it was poorer. So there are several divides. Let me go quickly. Syntax divide. So logicians are very cavalier about syntax. 
we, we, we practically never write formulas. We write about formulas. You know, let phi be. Um, now, the engineers take syntax very seriously. Semantics divide. Here, it's just the opposite. That's where logicians shine, because we are very much aware. And engineers grossly underestimate. And there is a lot of troubles related to this. Uh, so what I want to say, it's, it's not that they need logical theorems. You know, if you prove sufficient something is sounding complete, the complete probably will never be in, of interest to them. It's the soundness that's important. It's the, 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 the vocabulary of logic that is so important. There is feasibility divide. You know, we used to just whatever is uh, computable to consider this as done. You know, I have a formula. Let's turn it into CNF. The fact that it take in general, exponential time was completely ignored. Now we're much aware of polynomial, what is polynomial, uh, log space, whatever it is. But these all are uh, asymptotic notions. So in, in any real world, uh, in any real problem, the, the range of instances is more or less uh, determined. Now, suppose you speak I, IRS, how many files they have? Uh, at least a billion and probably less than 100 billions. So if you have an algorithm that works in this span, works well, and then double exponential somewhere beyond that, what do you care? But this, I, I think this wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, so their feasibility is very much down to earth. If you can speed up by 5%, it's great. Uh, So he, uh, I came back to the declarative operational. So a piece of software is uh, like, like a biological body. It leaves. It evolves all the time. So something is rewritten. Some patches are made. Some errors are found. So if you have a book in, de declarative, in declarative language, and it's never clear whether the book ever reflected uh, the state of software. Another problem that engineers, the chances are engineers can't read this book. And of course, it doesn't reflect the current state of affairs. And, and you cannot play with this. You cannot. So that's uh, where tools like our uh, Spec Explorer comes. Because you can execute on any level, not, not so efficiently, but on small examples, you can do it. Um, OK. Maybe to, 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 to leave a couple of minutes for question, I'll, I'll say just the main idea. Mathematicians do logic. They don't call it logic. I, so um, in this country, logicians spent enormous amount of time, enormous effort to gain um, respect of mathematicians. Now, I'm not so hopeful about the future, because if if I'm a uh, logician and I go to some area, I have to, in order to, to be useful, I have to become a real expert in that area. The question arises, what's easier for me to learn algebraic geometry or for algebraic geometers to learn logic? And it's a toss up. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> well, we have time for. For a few people to toss up questions. <laughs> yes, so I, I, I strongly agree with your, your main issue uh -huh. of going between your, the design and, and the implementation and, and keeping them reflective <coughs> and having automatic tools for that. So I think, I think that's what the main focus of your talk is that this should be possible, it's important. Is, is, it, is that right? Uh, that would be a different talk. Okay. I would speak about our Spec Explorer, how it worked, and yeah, yeah, yeah. very interesting things, what happened to us. Now, I wanted to present, um, <coughs> let's see. There are not many logicians. I, 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 I don't know anybody, another logician at Microsoft. So I'm in the land of a kind of logician in the land of Oz. Oh. 
as written with S, OS, operating <laughs> systems. <laughs> so I'm coming from the land of Oz and I want to tell you what is there. And the logic is badly needed. And the question is, what kind of logic? You can come with your logic and say, here is my tools, show me the, the, your nails. <laughs> this will not work. But if you go and talk to them, so many problems have logic context. Ben was uh, in, in turn with our group and did very useful work, which was logical. It, it was not circuit complexity, but it, it was by and large logic, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It was very useful. Yeah, I, I think one more. Oh. I have a quick comment and a suggestion. So the comment is on automata theory. I went many years to Waterloo where they had a big project to modernize the, to help modernize the Oxford English Dictionary because it was a vast, a vast thing that had developed over several decades. And in order to modernize it, it had to be made computer readable. So a professor there, whose name I last have forgotten, uh, found that he could really see the structure of the element. So it's parsing on structure, not parsing on linguistics. And that he was able to then uh, automatically parse 80% of the whole dictionary. And then the lexicographers could fix up the things that had anomalies and things to it. So that was, I think, a great success of automata theory on a different level than, say, on parsing and, and programming. Suggestion on dot, uh, .net. I just heard Stephen Wolfram talk about reactivating the code for SMP, which was the precursor, the precursor to uh, Mathematica. And of course, the language had been forgotten, and the computer that it ran on it had been forgotten. But they were able to piece things together and make a virtual machine to run the old code. There are many dead languages. There are many dead machines. The, the question of Turing's history is very interesting, too, because uh, the machines he used are, are dead. So making virtual machines for historical reasons is quite an interesting project. And so my suggestion is to think of that, because ideas get lost because the technology is no longer functioning. I agree with the second. Let me comment on the first part. Uh, so when I was at Michigan, I was attending a linguistic seminar. Not because I wanted to do anything, just interesting. So when I moved to Microsoft, there was a lot of linguists. The seminar was sort of boring because they all were computational linguists and a kind of brute force. I remember this because today it's a not finite state machines. It's a big data and so much data that it needs to be mined and there are very different methodologies, machine learning. But basically it's kind of brute force and amazingly it works. It, if you, for many purposes like autom automated translation. So, Thanks again.